<laughs> so about 10 years ago, I just published my second book and I received an invitation, the first one in my life, to go and speak outside of America. And I was pretty excited. It was in Singapore. And as part of that engagement, the team at Singapore decided to organize with a local bookstore to have a book signing event, which was even cooler. Because when you write a book, you always want to sign the book. So when people say, will you sign my book? The answer is always yes, right? That's one of the reasons you write the book, to be able to do that. So I was very excited. And I showed up to Singapore, and I was like, I was feeling like a superstar, right? And then I went to the bookstore, and I was ready for my talk, and I showed up there, and I told them who I was, and they said, who? And I said, who I was, and they said, I'm sorry, you want to buy what book? And I said, no, no, I'm not buying a book. I'm here to, to sign a book. We're doing a book event. And they said, no, I don't think so. Uh, and I said, yeah, it's on the schedule. And finally, I gave them the details of the book. They said, oh, yeah, 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 we do have, we do have this. We do have it. Uh, and so now I'm ready, I'm back on track, I'm thinking, I'm picturing the audience, I'm like ready to go. It's gonna be one of those book readings that you see in movies and TV shows, right? Where the audience is standing there and then one person gives you a standing ovation then everybody else gives you a standing ovation. That's what I'm picturing in my head, right? And as they take me into the bookstore, they take me in between the stacks, right? The rows of books into the business section and it's in the middle of the stacks and I look down and I see this. This is what they have organized for me for my book signing event with no chairs. And they said, here you go. So I'm standing there with my microphone and I'm looking around and nobody's there. And then one person walks up and she says, do you know where the bathroom is? <laughs> uh, and I told her, which makes me basically store staff at this point, right? And then someone else walks up and stands there clearly there for my event that hasn't started yet. So now I'm thinking, okay, this is my chance to create this viral movement, right? I'll start with one person, I'll start talking, people will start coming, and I'll turn this into a book reading. And she, sits, she stands there very patiently for I don't know how many minutes, but more minutes than would have been reasonable, right? She was super patient. And then finally she raises her hand. You're the only one here, you don't have to raise your hand. But she raises her hand and she says, what are you gonna sing? <laughs> Yeah, that was not my best moment. Um, that was every author's worst nightmare, showing up to something and having a book reading and nobody's there. So I was not feeling like a superstar after this moment. But a couple weeks later, I got an email. And this email had no subject line. And you know what types of emails have no subject line, right? But for some reason, I chose to open it. And when I opened it, I saw this message that said, my assistant read your book and loved it. I have a new book coming, let's talk. And then it has the person's name and their phone number. That's it. So, of course, I Google this person and I find out that he's a legendary Hollywood producer, like legendary. So, of course, now I'm a little interested, I'm intrigued. So I take the phone and I call the number and I talk to this guy. We talk for 10 minutes and he says, look, I really like your ideas. We're about to go and launch my book. Come to LA come and meet with me. I said, okay, I'll come and, and meet with you in LA. Uh, so I get to LA and I drive up to his place and it turns out the office that he invited me to is actually his home. And his home is so big that it has two gates that you have to drive through. So I'm in my small rental Kia driving through Beverly Hills. I go through the first gate, then I get to the second gate, go through the gate, tell them who I am, park in the visitor slot, and then I'm ushered into what looks like a mansion. And as I'm walking through the front door of this mansion, I happen to look up the hill to see the much bigger second mansion. Because this small mansion is his office and the bigger mansion is the one he lives in. So we're in his tiny mansion, about to have a meeting. And as I'm waiting for him to come in, I'm looking around and I see on the side, I see Oscars, like actual Oscars in this trophy case. And I see a life-size Batman suit that like a crazy comic book fan would have in their home. And as I go a little closer and I look at the inscription on this, I see that it's the actual suit that Michael Keaton wore in Batman. That's what this suit is. So this guy is, you know, big time. And he walks in, in a upper and lower matching jumpsuit. And he's got a Ziploc bag in his pocket, which he pulls out and he unrolls it on the uh, pool table inside of his 
second mansion office. And he's got 15 different colored pills that he empties out into his hands. He puts them all in his mouth, and then he takes out some yoo and he just washes it all down with his yoo which for my non-American friends is a, uh, it's not a chocolate milk, it's a chocolate flavored drink, <laughs> which is what it says on the bottle. That tells you everything you need to know about you know, what that is. Right. And now he's ready for the meeting. So we have the meeting and I give him some ideas and I think he's resonating with the ideas. I think he's like pretty into it. And at the end of all of those things, he asks me the question that I should have anticipated, but didn't. He says, thank you for all these ideas. Now, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? Perfectly reasonable question, right? I helped him, I showed up, I went through all of this stuff, I, I gave him all of the ideas that I could possibly think of. It's reasonable for him to say, what can I do for you? And in the moment, I couldn't come up with anything because his world was not my world. I wasn't from the place that he was from. I didn't have a movie I was producing. I didn't have anything that I could go to a Hollywood producer and say, yeah, help me with this thing. I was at this moment in the road, I was at this fork in the road and I couldn't think of anything because I was stuck. And the moment I was stuck in is one that I think we're all familiar with. It's that moment when you just can't get the new idea. You can't get the next thing. You're stuck in the obvious. You're stuck in the things you know, and so you're unable to imagine the things you don't. And that, for me, was a huge challenge. It brought me to this attention on something that I had struggled with but didn't realize it until that moment. And I decided right then that I was not going to be in a situation like that again. Not about the Hollywood producer, about asking for a favor or cashing in, so to speak. I was happy to help him. That wasn't the point. The point was that I had a limitation on how I saw the world. And it bothered me. I didn't want that anymore. I wanted to be more open-minded. I didn't want to just see the same thing and then pour more fuel on it and have the same thing. Because we all get trapped in this moment. We all get trapped in the obvious, and it surrounds us. And so from that point, I started thinking about how to be more non-obvious. And eventually I started writing books about being non-obvious, and I started coming to this stage and talking about being non-obvious and sharing trends and insights and ideas and all of those things. And when they invited me to come back this year, I thought, I wanna try and do something that I've never done before. I want to do something non-obvious for me, which is to talk about something totally different. And I knew that this was the right stage to do it because as Hugh said, we were both in Sydney a couple months ago. And in Sydney, we were getting ready backstage to go on. He was getting mic'd up, I was getting mic'd up. And there was a moment when we were both sitting there and the AV guy came out and he did one of these. He walked back out as soon as he saw me. And what he'd done is he looked at me and then he walked out. And as a professional speaker, you know that there's three types of microphones you can get. You can get a handheld microphone. You can get a lavalier microphone, which is like a black microphone, like what I have now, which is usually black. Or you can get a headset microphone. And headset microphones generally are skin tone, which means they're white, most of them. But what this AV guy had done is he saw what I look like he went to the back and he pulled out a brown-toned microphone for me, which they already had ready to go. And that was minutes before I was going on stage. And because of that, I felt this sense of belonging that I was in this place that was safe, that was trusted, where I trusted them and they trusted me. And my talk reflected that because this is right before I'm going on stage. This is the moment. And that's why I love Southwest, South by Southwest. I love South by Southwest because it's a trusted place. It's a place of belonging. It's a place where we can go and share new ideas. And so that's why I'm doing something that I haven't done before. I'm gonna share with you the secrets, so to speak, of non-obvious thinking. Why I'm able to do what I do, why I can talk about the future and share all of these things about the future and be a futurist and all of the things that I've shared with you if you've seen any of my past talks, or if you want to go on YouTube and watch them afterwards, which you certainly can, but I wanna give you the ability to do that for yourself. Because the thing is, we need more of that. Obvious thinking is all around us. 
An obvious thinking is this inability to imagine something different. It's an inability to think bigger, to be more open-minded, to shift your perspective. And the question is, what if more people in the world didn't have this barrier? What if all of us didn't? What could we come up with? What could we imagine that we can't currently imagine? Now, there's a few ways that this holds us back. There's some human problems that are made worse by obvious thinking. And before we can figure out how to be more non-obvious, we have to identify what those are. And the first one is this global rise of loneliness and anxiety that is talked about in many different ways, the epidemic of loneliness that is out there. Anxiety felt by young people, but also people of all ages because of everything we see in the world around us. And it leads to these feelings of isolation, these feelings of lost optimism. And you see stories and reflections of this all over. There's a guy who married a hologram because he wanted someone who was always there for him. There was this fascinating statistic I came across in a study about work that said 90% of intergenerational or interracial friendships start at work. So in a world where we all start doing virtual work or working remotely, those relationships start to become harder. Now you only interact with people like you and not people from different generations or people from different backgrounds who aren't like you. Now we see lots of science fiction too that's imagining this future world that's giving us all of these pictures of what the future is going to be like and they all pretty much boil down to one argument which is that in the future we're basically all screwed. That's what they all say. And that's not a good way to live. All of this rage is inside us and like we need stuff we never needed before like punching bags in the middle of the street so that we can just randomly walk up and punch things. <laughs> Maybe that'll help, right? If we just get our rage out in some way. Second big problem is noise and choice overload. We have so much noise that we just don't know. We don't know what to pay attention to anymore because there's so much stuff. We think that we want all of these things all in one. But when we do get all of this stuff, we're, I don't know what to use first. I don't know how to navigate this. And technology makes it worse because we need every choice presented to us, even the idiotic ones. They're always there. And so we can't tell what the difference is. There was a scientist who thought he'd be funny and he posted a picture of a chorizo and said it was a new planet that he discovered. <laughs> and everyone thought it was real. Until he's like, whoa, 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 this is, this, is, this is a piece of chorizo. This is not a new planet that we discovered. There's no planet chorizo. Some of you are thinking that might be pretty awesome, Planet Chorizo, by the way. <laughs> but no, I'm sorry to burst your bubble. But every story we get, we're presented at the bottom of the story with other stories that we have to read. My roommate moved in and I did something very creepy and I can't stop thinking about it. Whoa, what did you do? What do I, I need to read this story. And by the way, if that's not interesting enough, I surely need to know what Alyssa Milano looks like right now. So I'll click on one of these stories because that's what we keep getting fed, right? That's the clickbait. And we know it's clickbait. And we feel bad when we click on it. But sometimes it's there and it's hard. Now we're also in the middle of a modern believability crisis where we just don't know what to trust. And so we're unwilling to trust anyone or anything. And in the US, we're about to come up with a presidential election. And everyone's worried about deep fakes and AI. And I spoke to several experts about deep fakes and AI. And one of them said something really interesting. He said, I'm not as worried about the impact of AI and deep fakes on the US election this year. And the reason he's not that worried is because trust is so low that people don't believe anything. <laughs> so they won't believe the deep fake also. That's a pretty depressing place to be when your only fight against lies is the fact that no one believes anything anymore. But we just don't know. I mean, we have all of these faces and I will go to audiences, less tech savvy audiences than you, and I'll ask them, okay, who believes the face on the top row is, is uh, AI generated? And who believes the face on the bottom row is AI generated? And some of you have already figured out that they're all AI generated. None of these are real people. They're just faces generated by AI. Because the impact of that and what it can do is getting to be more and more amazing. We're seeing examples of that, right? And it's scary and it's mind-blowing. 
And it's all of the things that you, all the words that you would use to describe it. But it makes it harder to know what's true. So everything has to be breaking news in order to get you to pay attention to it. That's the only way to get people to pay attention. Or maybe we just need better statistics, right? 82% of statistics are completely made up. You know how I know that? Because I asked 84% of you right before this. I'm making up all these statistics as I'm telling them to you. That's what numbers can sometimes be. But we see this over and over. Evian is naive spelled backwards. Is that a conspiracy theory? Is this water actually coming from the Swiss Alps? <laughs> Many of you have heard this one before. Please listen carefully as our menu options have changed. No, they fucking haven't. They're the same menu options that they've always been. Why do we have these messages? Why do we see all of these things, right? We see this over and over again, these unbelievable messages. And we see them and we are impacted by them because our faith in the trust of what we're seeing goes down further and further. These are four pictures of four women who apparently, hotness comes in all shapes and sizes, but those four women are basically the same size. So I don't know what you're supposed to feel after seeing something like that, but definitely not good because it's all a story and we believe and we hear over and over again, especially for someone like me who comes from the world of marketing, that if you have a great story, people will buy it. All you need is a great story. That's the secret. Great story. That's it. That's the secret. Everyone buys that. Who wouldn't want a donut tree? that would come from this. That sounds like the best thing ever. Until eventually you figure it out, right? And so what the impact is of all of this stuff leading from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing is we're just pissed off. We don't even belong to a, a political party. Our political party is pissed off in all places around the world, right? And maybe we need someone to blame. Maybe it is capitalism that's to blame. Maybe it is, maybe it's something else. But that's the challenge, right? That's the challenge. Now, the fourth big thing is it's a lack of purpose, a lack of motivation. We can't imagine a better world. We can't imagine a better future. And so we just don't know what to do. And sometimes we have even the moments of reflection that highlight this for us, right? There was a great viral post where Adam Grant said, what was the worst career advice you've ever received? And the best response I saw to this was Monica Lewinsky. I mean, this was just... <laughs> How epic is that, right? I mean, talk about owning your, your, your story. That is just too amazing. She is amazing. That is too amazing, right? But we see like quiet quitting happening because we just aren't happy with what we have. We always want something else. We want something more. And there's a very real existence of what is called bullshit jobs. This book does an excellent job of explaining what is a bullshit job. A bullshit job is one that has no purpose for existing, where even the person doing it can't justify it. There are people who are paid, as an example used in the book, there are people who are paid as security guards for museum exhibits that are in transition. So they're literally guarding an empty room. That's their job. That is a bullshit job. And even the person who is doing the job, yeah, they're doing it because they need the paycheck. Okay, I understand, we all understand. But there's no purpose in that. And it's not a good feeling to have that. And the last challenge here is the unconscious bias and low empathy that comes from obvious thinking because we only see the world from a perspective like our own. And when we only see perspectives like our own, we lead to misunderstanding and a lack of belonging. This is a brilliant example from an African journalist who wrote about what was happening in America in the format that American news usually writes about Africa. So read this for a second, just think about the way this is written and the bias that's built into the way that this is written and how that's usually presented in the opposite way by how Western media reports about Africa. It's really interesting because you can, when it's flipped around, the bias is pretty obvious, is it not? But when we read it the other way, so we meaning people who are living in the US and, and other Western nations reading this type of media, that's what we see. We have biases about what we think people should look like. And then there's viral activities of things where we don't, where we question that, where we have moments in our lives 
where we question that. And there was a moment in, in my life where I was invited to an event for a hotel brand, and the speaker right before me was a Trump impersonator. And he was really funny. And this was during when Trump was president. Um, so it was very timely, the comedy that he had. And he was delivering his whole thing, and I was following him. And this particular brand has lots of franchise owners um, across the world. And the vast majority of them are South Asian. So the food they had was South Asian, the audience there was South Asian, and I was, you know, I'm South Asian. So I was presenting in front of this audience, and I was just doing my thing, talking about non-obvious ideas. And after the talk, one older gentleman, probably about my dad's age, came up to me, and he had tears in his eyes. And he said, I've been coming to these events for more than 20 years. This is the first time I ever saw someone who looked like us on stage. First time. I didn't realize the impact of that. I didn't realize the impact it would have on someone of his generation to see that. Because it was so different. And he felt seen. And he felt recognized. And that's one of the beautiful things about being here, that there's so much diversity that all of us have a chance to be seen in that way and not be stuck in this idea of obvious thinking. Because obvious thinking leads to a failure of imagination. And the thing is, the only future we can imagine, that's what we're going to make. That's the way that the future works. We make the future that we imagine. And what we need in the world to solve all of this is more non-obvious thinking. We need more people to do what Isaac Asimov famously said, which is not be a speed reader, but be a speed understander. Be a speed understander. Be the sort of person who understands people. The people who understand people always win. And I've seen this over and over and over. The people who understand people always win. Because what they're able to do is put things that don't seem like they belong together, together to create something new. And that's one definition of creativity. So what does it take to be able to see what others miss? How do you do this for yourself? True to the title of this talk, I have four elements that I want to try and share with you for how you could do this. And I promise you I'm going to do a couple of things with this. One is, at the end of them, I'm going to give you one slide that summarizes the whole thing. So if you're one of those people that takes notes by taking photos of slides, I'll tell you when that slide is. <laughs> you could take a photo of it. And you could go back to the office and justify your existence here. <laughs> to them. <laughs> That's one thing that I'll do. The other is, at the end, I'm going to give you a QR code where you can get onto the email list that Hugh mentioned. I'll also send you the copies of my slides. And I will send you an excerpt from the soon-to-be-released in September book uh, that is not quite done yet, but at least I have an excerpt that we desperately got ready for you for today. You know how that is, right? You know how it is. You got to get ready for this. All right, so that's all of the stuff I'm going to give you. And it's going to start with these four elements of non-obvious thinking. The first one is create space. Create space for new ideas. And there's many ways that we can all create more space. One is by changing the way that we breathe. This amazing book researches, and many of you have read this book, or seen it at least, researches the way that we breathe and fundamentally finds that most of us breathe wrong. The optimal way for humans to breathe according to the research, is five and a half seconds breathing in and five and a half out. Now, you might do this if you meditate, but you definitely don't do this throughout your entire day. If you could, you would inject more calm into your day. Think about that. Try that a little bit right now. We're all friends, right? You can try it like here. Nobody's watching you. But if we're breathing wrong, what else are we doing wrong <laughs> in terms of filling our day with things, filling our lives with moments, trying to do that one thing that we all do where we're just trying to get that last thing done before we finally almost kill ourselves, right? Pretty good at that multitasking. We're not so good at just looking around, paying attention, seeing the world. 
If we could, we would create more space for ourselves. So that's where it starts. That's one way to start. And it doesn't always work to imagine you're doing this. This is how they used to teach kids how to swim back in the day. Probably not that effective, right? So it's not only about trying to imagine things. You actually have to do things too, right? You have to create what I call in the book oasis moments. Moments amidst something crowded where you can stand out and do something unique and different. And for the last several South by Southwests, my team and I have been hosting several of these. So last night, we had a pajama party. Unusual at South by Southwest. But we brought people together and we celebrated together. We've also done surprise book gatherings where we brought authors together and you can meet the authors and get copies of their books. I mean, these are not big, huge parties. We've done that also. But these are small moments, small gatherings. And what you'll see actually this year throughout South by Southwest at seven different venues, starting with one that I'll tell you about in a second, is our signature seven minute meetup, which some of you have been to before. And it is, in fact, seven minutes. And the idea behind this is that you come for seven minutes, you get to introduce yourself and be introduced to someone new, and you tell them something non-obvious about yourself. That's it. And by doing that, you make a personal connection with someone who you might not have otherwise met. And we've done this at multiple South by Southwest in the past. We did it in Sydney. And people came up to us afterwards and they said, oh my god, I found the most amazing person. We're doing a podcast together. Two people started dating. Not that you're looking for that, but you know, and not that we're promising that either. But you never know is the point, right? So you can find out about many of these. And the first one we're doing, which is the official first one, is right after this talk at the Registrants Lounge, which is right across from the Starbucks inside of the Hilton. It's across the street. And that's the place when you checked in and got your badge, you got a free drink ticket. That is the place to use that drink ticket. So yes, I'm promising you free drinks because you already got them, right? I didn't give them to you, but you know, you can use it if you haven't used it yet. And you can join us at 5.38 PM for seven minutes. So that's the time for the first one. And there's others. If you can't make that one, there's others throughout the week, weekend. And the idea is to create these oasis moments. And we're not the only ones that can do that. You can do that for yourself. You can choose to rush from one session to the next, or you can choose to sit at a long table where other people are also sitting and strike up a conversation. This is a great place to be able to do both of those things. You don't have to overschedule yourself. You can try and do that, and you can do it and connect with people. These types of moments are one great way to do it. The other thing you can do to create space is practice mental time travel. So mental time travel is the idea that you can imagine a future and then picture how your world might be different. And it's introduced brilliantly in this book by Jane McGonigal called Imaginable, where she talks about an example of an asteroid forecast, a moment in the future, fictional future, where you would wake up and you would check the asteroid forecast and see whether it's likely, highly likely, that an asteroid's going to hit where you are or not. And she asked the question, well, based on that, if you were living in a high probability area, would you change where you live? Would you move? What type of risk would be acceptable for you to move? How would our lives be different if this was the first thing we had to do every single morning? And by the way, depending on what country you live in, some people's first thing that they have to do every day in the morning is check the air pollution index to see whether it's safe to go outside. That's reality for some people in some countries or some cities right now. So it's not that far-fetched. I mean, it is a little far-fetched, but it's not that far-fetched, right? The next thing you can do is actually be an ally. So, uh, two years ago, I launched a book that I co-authored with an amazing professional named Jennifer Brown that was all about diversity. And today, we're on International Women's Day. And one of the things, yeah, please, you know, clap for that. You should. You should. <laughs> one of the things that somebody told me is they said, look, you're speaking on International Women's Day. You're obviously not a woman. So you better make sure that you have enough females that you're featuring in your talk. And I said, well, that's fair to tell me. I mean, it's a good reminder. But then I went and looked at my presentation and I said, you know what? I don't have to change anything because I was already featuring a lot of women in my talk, female authors, female scientists, female uh, co-authors. We should already be doing that every day, not just today. I shouldn't have to change my entire presentation just because I happen to be speaking on International Women's Day. 
I should be able to roll with the exact same talk I have because I'm celebrating women and their achievements in my talk already. That's the point that I want to be at where I don't have to change. And one of the things we did during this book that was really fascinating was we brought in a lot of sensitivity readers to go in and look at parts of the book. And when you bring in a lot of different freelancers, they quote wildly different amounts for different things. And so what we did is we looked at all the different freelancers that were quoting for this work, and we said, this is what the budget's going to be. And for the freelancers that quoted less, we went back to them and we said, your budget is now going to be the higher budget. We're going to pay everybody the same. Because first of all, we want equity across this. But second and most importantly, we want the freelancers who were charging less to be able to have the confidence to charge more because someone was willing to pay it, even though they didn't ask for it. Because when someone's willing to pay you for something at a certain amount, now it's easier for you to tell yourself that you are worth that. Because I can theoretically tell you you're worth it, or I can put my money behind it and say you're worth this amount, and therefore your rate should be higher. And that's what ends up happening. When we lift people up and give them the money that they deserve, it costs us as business owners, me as a business owner, a little bit more, yes. But it lifts somebody up and causes their career to take a different path, maybe. Maybe it's just, oh man, that guy was a huge sucker and I got to charge him more and then they go back to doing what they do, right? I don't necessarily know. But what I believe is that it makes a difference. And the only thing I can do is act based on what I believe, right? I can only make the choices based on what I think. That's my... Uh, chance to do something different. That's my chance to be able to do something. And the more we celebrate that, the more we spotlight those. I mean, this app is, did a great job of it. This app, you can put it on, put it in the middle of a meeting. It came out of Asia, and it will measure the number of times that a voice with a deeper octave interrupts a voice with a higher octave. And it measures the interruptions. And then it gives you a score afterwards. And now there's AI tools that also do this where they give you like percentages for a meeting where it's like this person talked for this percentage of the time, right? And this person talked for that percentage. So you can get like a report after the meetings to give you a real sense of is somebody dominating the conversation? Mathematically, is somebody dominating the conversation? And do we need to change it? These are all ways that we can create space. And that's the first. The second element of this is uncover insights. Uncover insights by observing. Seek unfamiliar stories. I interviewed Dr. Ashley Shu. She's an amazing writer and educator at Virginia Tech who talks about living with a disability and what we misunderstand about people with disabilities. And it's all part of an annual book awards program that my team does in partnership with Inc. where we celebrate amazing diverse books from diverse perspectives. And these are just a few of the books that made the long list in this year or past years that are also speakers here at South by Southwest amazing individuals. And every month I get to write a column for Inc. Magazine, in the magazine, about a new, interesting, different book, celebrating big ideas, celebrating new authors, and helping people to think maybe in just a little bit more of a non-obvious way about unusual stories. This musical that was wildly popular is an unusual take on the past six wives of Henry VIII from their perspective. Great music, high energy show, amazing. Because when we uncover insights, what we manage to do is speak the right language. So I'll share a video with you that also demonstrates the importance of speaking the right language. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächter. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are thinking, we're thinking. What are you thinking about? And speaking the right language, life or death, right? Life or death. You can find insights in all different places. And I come from an industry that is all based on insights. And you can see them if you start to look in marketing and advertising that has it and marketing and advertising that doesn't. Airbnb's new campaign, they pretty clearly looked at the reasons people stay at an Airbnb. And all of those, their videos are showing a couple going on a trip 
and realizing that if they were in a hotel room, the same time their kid goes to bed is when they have to go to bed. But in Airbnb, they can stay up later. Or a bunch of friends who now have to stay in separate rooms but now can stay together. Or can choose they're having their own pool because they don't want to be around other people. Or having more space. Or having like a dog and being in an apartment or a place where you can actually get out faster like a house versus being stuck in a uh, hotel with an elevator. Like all of those things are real insights and the tagline brings it home. Some trips are better in an Airbnb. Not all trips, not every time, but some trips. It's hard to argue with the truth of a tagline like that. Dove has done this in their campaigns for many, many years. And I used to work for an agency that was doing a lot of the Dove campaigns. And they would have these real, this was one of the things they did. They called it real beauty sketches, where someone would describe themselves to a sketch artist. And then that artist would draw them. And then a stranger who had met that person would describe the same individual. And the sketch artist would draw based on that description. What they found was that most people who went through this were more beautiful than they described themselves to be. That was the insight. And that was the tagline. You're more beautiful than you think. It came from that insight. That's how those translate in the world of marketing and advertising. In the trend world, what we tend to pay attention to is long shifts. So for example, Getty Images, the most popular source for stock photography, has an image. And they release uh, research. And one of the points of research they released, and I watched this presentation from someone at Getty Images, and they said the fatherhood term, the number one best-selling stock image for fatherhood in 2007 used to be a dad playing football. And you can see over time how it shows the softer side of fatherhood. It's a shift in how fatherhood is depicted through stock images, which is only one way to measure how it's depicted, but it's a long shift over a period of time. That's how we see it, right? So when you uncover insights, you're able to seek these unfamiliar stories. You can spot the difference, and you can pay attention to long shifts. The third element is find the focus. Find the focus with curation. So see the big picture, right? I'm going to show you an image, and then I'm going to ask you two questions about it, all right? Actually, probably one question, because if you don't raise your hand, then you probably saw the other thing. How many people, when you look at this image, the first thing you see is a duck or some sort of bird? OK. All right, hands down. How many people see the rabbit? OK, hands down. Now, this is one of those classic personality tests where I can make up something about how if you saw this one, it meant this, or if you saw this one, it meant that. But what I find much more interesting about this is that neither answer is correct. They're both correct. And we don't like to live in that world very often, do we? Where both things can be right. But that's the big picture sometimes, that there can be multiple right answers. There can be multiple right people when it comes to some things. Right? And we have to be able to wrap our brain around that because we have to see the bigger picture. Right? And that's what AI is sort of doing for us in some situations. Right? It's allowing us to expand and see the bigger picture that we wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. And I love this analogy, which is a magic eye test that some of you might recognize, where if you stare at it long enough, and if you look not at it, but like beyond it, and if you can just move your eyesight just a little bit, you can see a pattern emerge. You can see something emerge in 3D. And we had a big debate during rehearsals, not a debate, but like a back and forth, like how long would I need to leave this up for somebody to be able to see the 3D image that pops out in it? And would you even be able to see it? So I'm not going to leave it up for super long. And I realize that it's going to be frustrating for some of you who didn't quite see it. That's the nature of this puzzle. Like It's meant to be frustrating in that way. And I'm going to show you what you would have seen. But um, this is about as long as I can wait, because we got to keep rolling. So uh, what's shown there is South by Southwest. Some of you might have been able to pull that out. right? It was a custom created one. But the point is that the way those magic eye diagrams work is that you have to shift your focus. You can't look at it. You have to look beyond it, which I find to be a really beautiful metaphor for non-obvious thinking itself. That if you can just shift your perspective to think a little bit further, maybe you'll see something that other people don't see. Now, the other element of focus is that because we have so much noise, we have to be able to manage it downwards. And what was really interesting is I talk a lot about curators, and in particular, museum curators, who do an amazing job because they're taking a full collection of artifacts of things that they could possibly put on display, 
and they're selecting what they choose to put on display, which is not an easy thing to do. And so, of course, I did a Google search for museum curator, and I found real-life pictures of curators who all seem to stand the same way, <laughs> which I guess is the official museum curator pose. Um, if you are a museum curator, maybe you'll come up to me afterwards and we can take photos together like that. But the point is they're doing amazing work to curate stuff. And <coughs> excuse me, my process for years and years has been to curate ideas into trends. This is a big part of the work that I've done when it comes to identifying trends and sharing trends. And for this show in particular, one of the things that our team did is we curated experiences. Because it's so crowded and because there's so many things to do, we put together a bunch of itineraries, similar to what you might find on a travel website. So if you're interested in, for example, imagining the future, here are a bunch of sessions that you might be able to go to. Here are a bunch of things that you might be able to do. And they're not just South by Southwest sessions. There's also like a recommendation for an amazing coffee shop you might be able to go to, owned by a, a great entrepreneur, a Latina entrepreneur. There's uh, examples of things that you can go to. Because the idea is that we're coming with these things that we want. And whether we're trying to imagine the future, or make ourselves better, or try and be more entrepreneurial, or maybe my favorite itinerary here is the tell me something new itinerary, which is a great reason to go to anything, to learn something new. You can download all of those from this website. So all of those itineraries for every single day are available right now on the itinerary um, thing. And if they're not for you know, a couple days from now, uh, they should be up by the end of today. Um, they're all in final production. And these are not everything you could do, of course. And there's amazing things that you could also do that we're going to try and spotlight. But the thing we're trying to do is help make this navigable for you in a way that allows you to pull these pieces together. Now, the next thing you can do when it comes to focus is bring out emotion. And I want to show you one of the most powerful videos that I've ever seen that brings out emotion. And it does it without using any images at all. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to give them whatever they need. I mean, so much emotion just with words. And when we bring out that emotion, we focus on what's most important. And it's really powerful. 
Now, it doesn't always have to be a deep emotion in the same sense. Monopoly is doing the same thing with their series of billboards ads talking about how this game <clears throat> that is annoyingly frustrating teaches kids how to deal with anger because they're going to get angry and they're going to yell at each other. And so what better tool than using this game to teach them? It's another way of bringing out emotion. Because you can find the focus by seeing the big picture, by elevating with meaning like curators do, and by bringing out the emotion in any way. And the last piece is define a twist. Define a twist to be unique. And a twist is something that Van Moof Electrical Bike Company, which sadly is not around anymore, but when they were around, they were shipping these beautiful bikes and they were getting huge damages because they would just get thrown around. And it was a major problem to fix. And they were finding really expensive solutions like adding more packaging to the bikes or shipping them in a different way. But then they came up with a pretty clever, inexpensive solution, which is they drew a TV on the box. And by drawing a TV on the box, the people who were carrying it thought it was a TV and they were more, you know, they were more careful with it. And therefore, the damages went way down and the bikes arrived without all those damages. So sometimes hacking human behavior and finding a clever solution is the best way to do it. Now, I talked a little bit before about binary solutions, about seeing one thing or the other. And there was one entrepreneur who saw both things, a woodworker, and he said, well, we have rolling mattresses and we have couches. Why don't we put those things together and turn it into a futon? And a futon is both together in one. It's a convertible bed. And that's an option C. That's the third option that comes from being able to look at everything out there and saying, oh, I'm going to put this together with this and come up with something new. These beer brands and beer initiatives have done exactly the same thing. Bex launched a beer that had a different taste profile for people over the age of 50. So it was more bitter and it was more pleasurable, apparently, in taste tests for people who were older. Rococo Luxury is a luxury beer that's priced as a luxury beer. And Rupee Beer is a beer based on basmati rice that's made for drinking with spicy food. All different categories inside of beer, right? We can also choose to be unexpected. So we can take a straight on regular image, or we can do what this amazing photographer has done on his Instagram, and I highly suggest you go and check it out and follow it if you are a dog lover, which is, you captures dogs in the moment when they're about to have that treat, which is total delight in every one of these. And it's so unexpected, and it works. It's amazing to flip through. I mean, you will waste lots and lots of time <laughs> scrolling through this. You know you will if you, love, uh, if you love dogs. This is a fantastic font example. It's Times New Roman, but every seventh letter is jarringly sans serif. And if you're a designer or somebody who loves design, you will immediately be repulsed and captivated by this at the same time. Because it just brings those pieces together in just this unsatisfying way. I mean, I live in the DC area. And in the DC area, we have this uh, thing that comes out every bundle of years, 17 years uh, for some. And they're cicadas. So they hibernate for 17 years, and then they emerge. And so we had a recent emergence, and one ice cream shop decided this was the perfect opportunity to take an unexpected <laughs> look at cicadas. And they made the cicada ice cream sundae that went totally viral, looking at something that was already there. These are all ideas that define a twist. They bring that twist together. They hack human behavior. They find an option C, and they're unexpected. That's the twist. So now we are at the first slide that I promised you, which is all of those pieces together, which is create more space, find new insights, shift your focus, and define with a twist. The acronym, because I'm a marketer and I love acronyms, is SIFT. And SIFT is how we can examine something thoroughly to isolate that which is most important or useful. SIFT is the key to being able to change the world by practicing more non-obvious thinking. This is the method to allow you to put the obvious thinking to the side 
and start to be more of a non-obvious thinker. This is what I've used for years and years to be able to see the future, do the futurist work, predict the trends, put all of those pieces together. And the one last thing that I'll leave you with, one final story that brings this together, is one of my favorite stories that I have actually told from the stage before, but there's an element at the end that I never mentioned, which I really should have. And the story is one of the Olympics which I'm a huge fan of, and I'm heading to Paris soon for the Olympics to watch. <laughs> Definitely not to do anything else. <laughs> Just in case you were wondering, I know you're looking at me thinking, wow, that guy, he must be like a heptathlete or something. But uh, no, it was just to watch. But the high jump uh, was an event that would be done in the same way pretty much every time. You would run over the bar, you'd kind of hurdle over it, you'd go like face first over it, until 1968 when one athlete saw the bar, decided to turn around backwards and backflip over the bar. It was a flop. And the technique became known as the Fosbury flop, named after Dick Fosbury, who sadly just passed away. But he won the gold medal doing the Fosbury flop. And in the past, I would talk about this and use it as an example of non-obvious thinking. What a non-obvious thinker to see the bar and think to himself, I'm going to run and jump over that backwards. But here's the missing piece that I never mentioned, and I realized that I should have. In 1968, the thing that was different is that athletes, when they would jump over this high bar, would land on a foam mat instead of on the ground. And because they were landing on a foam mat, taking off and landing on your back was possible. Because before, if you're jumping over it and landing on the same track, you couldn't do this. So he was innovative, and it was a non-obvious idea. But it was based on something that we underappreciate, which is noticing details. He paid attention to the fact that the landing material was changing, and so the takeoff approach could be different. Now, that detail was something only he paid enough attention to to change the format. And he wasn't the most gifted athlete by his own admissions that year, and yet he still won because his technique was superior, and his technique came from seeing a detail that no one else could see. And that's really what non-obvious thinking allows you to do. Non-obvious thinking allows you to see what others miss. And when you can do that, you can be more successful, you can propel your idea to the next level, and you can achieve the things that you want to achieve. But more than that, you can actually change the way the world works if you can become a non-obvious thinker. So, I promised one final piece, which is the QR code. And if you sign up here uh, and share your email address, we will send you probably sometime this weekend, uh, amidst everything else going on, we will send you the uh, excerpt for the book, the slides that you just saw, uh, and you will be on the list for the weekly newsletter. Um, you are welcome to stay on that. If it's not your thing, feel free to unsubscribe. No hard feelings. Uh, it's not anything except for one email every week. That's all you'll ever get from me. So as I mentioned to you, we have one big thing. This is the same QR code, by the way, in case you didn't get it yet. Um, we have one big thing happening straight outside the Starbucks at the Registrants Lounge. Uh, that's where you can get your free drink. That's where you can also get a bunch of non-obvious swag, including these amazing yellow sunglasses that you see some people around here wearing. You can get your own pair there for free. They're not being sold or anything. They're just there for you until we run out. Uh, so definitely come and hang out there. I will stick around here for a little bit, and then I'm going to head over to the Registrants Lounge. Come and see me there as well. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for being here. I love all of you.